this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Next Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering four conversations from Episode 6, Louise Campbell's interview with Dr. Tony Rahman, who serves as Director of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane, Australia, and an adjunct professor at James Cook University. Plus, from the vault, Conversation 23.5 from Season 3, in which German patient advocate Achim Kautz and former GLI Vice President of Policy and Public Affairs, Andrew Scott, joined Louise, Jorn Schottenberg, and me to discuss what Achim and Andrew consider the two key areas for focusing patient organizing and advocacy. Louise starts this conversation with an anecdote from her experiences in Australia, providing virtual clinics to those living six to ten hours drive away from the nearest consultation, the kind of remote population we've been talking about throughout this episode. She follows with a question to Tony on whether GPs want to buy into NAFLD and NASH in the same way that they responded to successful hepatitis C programs. Tony says yes, but alludes to some of the challenges in doing so. He notes the influences of how a problem and solution are presented on the uptake of interest particularly in a country where GPs are paid per patient and time away from education therefore translates into lost income. He suggests that rather than solely, as he puts it, bombarding GPs with education, change will be more readily adopted if there's a robust plan in place. He describes one such plan, a traffic light system adopted by Prince Charles Hospital that utilizes fiber scan to assess the likelihood of a patient developing liver disease in a given time period. Louise comments on the importance of seeking constant refinement in establishing these kinds of systems. From there, the discussion shifts to the topic of guidelines and use of FIB4 in primary care setting. Louise asks whether use of FIB4 is part of any Australian protocol and, if not, whether there's any traction for doing so. Tony maintains it's making headway along with calculating an AST to platelet ratio index, APR, popular measure in the effort to move patients along hepatitis C treatment. When Tony expresses wariness that oversubscribed GPs will have the time to prioritize making these calculations, Louise wonders about the value of joint referrals with cardiologists in the light of emerging recommendations from the cardiology community on risk assessment of NAFL. As this conversation winds down, Tony suggests that establishing convincing clarity around the link between fatty liver disease and cardiovascular outcomes will be attractive to the protocol led of Australian doctors. Comments on factors that will affect uptake and accessibility, factors such is the lack of a billing code for fiber skin. As you can see in this conversation, Australia combines some of the challenges that we all face, rapidly rising populations, bad food choices, particularly in certain minority communities, with some unique to its own, a very remote rural population and fairly low levels of expenditure. It is interesting to listen to Tony and Louise kick these issues around, to think about what they mean in the context of the countries that we live in and Australia as well. So what I suggest you do is just sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. Louise Campbell. You touched on it earlier, is also the fact that Australia lends that shared care system. I use, when I worked in Sydney, we did very much, as you were doing there, that virtual type clinic back in the early 2000s, where patients, instead of travelling every appointment six to ten hours to see us for 20 minutes or half an hour, we'd only do it once a quarter or once every six months to collect their medication, and we would do everything remotely in that whole sense. There are certain aspects like that that I think lend in to very well if we establish NAFLD in Australia as we know the numbers, we know the figures, that shared care system. Do GPs want to buy into NAFLD and NASH and want to know the education as well as they did for hepatitis C and the programs that you did there? Tony Rahman. I think the answer to your question is yes. Like most things, it's about how you present the problem and how you present the solution and the benefits to the GP and the patients. So just bombarding the GPs with education isn't necessarily the best way of getting the most out of the system. If you want to change things, you have to go with a reasonable plan that has been looked at, tested and is robust because what you don't want to do is try and set something up that then doesn't work. So it's really about making sure that whatever you're going to introduce, it has been tested in that environment, albeit when I say tested, even just as a sort of GP focus group tested that this is something that is acceptable. I mean, to give you an example, when I set up the Hep C side of things, I based it on the the Project Echo model from Mexico. So we set up the remote teaching, and once a week we set up you know four hours of teaching where GPs could log on with their cases, just like the Project Echo thing. But this wasn't Project Echo because you had to go and get signed off by Project Echo. This is going to be our Project Echo Light model. But what the GPs said when I initially presented it 
was that no one had time to spend four hours having a teaching session once a week because what other people in other countries may not realise is the GPs here get paid per patient they see. So time away from the patients is loss of income and the, the GP remuneration, again, it may be different in Western Australia, is not great. So the GPs generally have to work quite hard to earn a decent salary. So again, the GPs are very interested. And so what we did at Prince Charles, for example, uh, when we tried to introduce this traffic light system to try and keep less unwell patients at the surgery and bring the more unwell patients into the limited spaces that we have in clinic was really to sort of say to them, well, look, you, know, you might be seeing these people and then you're worrying about their liver function tests for years before you refer them. What we can do very quickly is get them in, do a fibro scan, do a screen and tell you immediately that this person is unlikely to have any liver, liver disease or any problems for the next five to 10 years, in which case you can actually stop seeing them. And, or if you, you don't necessarily you have to stop seeing them because obviously if you see them perhaps that's income generator so you don't want to stop seeing them but at the same time you can then stop worrying about them and I think they like that that this approach of meaning that they still could see the patients and they could still order the blood tests every six months which I think is appropriate but they didn't have to worry about them too much because as you alluded to amongst that cohort which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger there will be patients there who will actually have significant liver disease that are overlooked because they don't any, have any obvious signs of it. So I think they bought into that and that, that's what was popular. Then we, as I mentioned, we tried to do fibre scans in some of the larger centres. So we would go out, so our fibre scan nurse, for example, would go out to one of the healthcare centres and start trying to do fibre scans there to save the patients having to come in. The GPs would go and cohort them on a weekly basis. But what we found was that it wasn't actually that efficient. And so rather than her potentially doing 10 fibre scans in a morning or more in the clinic at Prince Charles, there were sort of dribs of drabs of one or two or or three or four. So that actually for us didn't really work. So we've learned as we've gone along, what we have now is a fairly good model that suits our local GPs and suits us. But again, it's constantly being refined. I think that's the key, isn't it? Constantly refine. We usually have Jean Schattenberg as our KOL on the podcast and he's involved with Jeff Lazarus in doing some of the new pathways for Naffold and Nash and they've got the Barcelona meeting in May. And what I'm taking from this, there are are certainly great pockets of where this works remotely with the primary care physicians, even if we're not picking up all of the patients. And I think Aparzal was one of the first, if not the first, major body to use FIB4 followed by Fibroscan. And if you can get it into a primary care sort of setting, use that, which has then been followed on across Europe and now with the American guidelines, AGA. And I think we're all moving to it. Yes, FIB4, we discuss regularly, isn't always the best, but it's better than we've had. Is it something that used a lot here to stratify or is it something that's just coming in and starting to get traction or is it not really making any headway? I think it's making headway. For, for, I mean, right from the outset, really the education that we've been providing is about using APRI FIB4 um, and obviously that really came on the back of all the Hep C stuff that happened five years ago, six years ago in terms of trying to get patients put forward for Hep C treatment. And so the GPs are familiar with the fact that these online calculators are available and they're very easy to use and the risk stratification is good because actually, you know, if you compare it to nothing, it's actually excellent. But I still think that, you know, if you're in this world and you, you're using this stuff all the time, it then gives you reassurance that it actually does work. But also what you do learn is where potentially it doesn't work. So when you see a slightly odd result, you can look at it and say, well, actually, that doesn't quite make sense. I'm going to look at this a little bit more. Now, I think that comes with looking at these things all the time. And it's a bit like using a fibre scan. Fibre scans are fantastic, but occasionally you'll get a, a slightly odd result where you have to look at it again and think, well, actually, this doesn't really make sense. And I think that's probably where the GPs probably feel a little bit uncomfortable because GPs are seeing, certainly in Queensland, some of the GPs might be seeing 30, 40 patients in a day. And so only a small proportion of those in a day will require them to go onto an online calculator and if they have the time to work out a FIB4 score. If I'm doing a liver clinic, we're pretty much doing it on every single patient for a whole morning. So I, I think that aspect of it needs 
needs to be taken into account that primary care is clearly where it is all happening. But in terms of the volume of patients these people see, the variety of patients they see, it may not be at the top of their list of things to do. Yeah, and going back slightly on that to the heart of Australia, do you ever get to jointly see the cardiac referrals? Because there's been a little bit of data coming out now that FIT4 predicts cardiac mortality. Not surprising. Uh, the American Heart Association have now added assessment for NAFLD in on their uh, recommendations. And in fact, comment on use of Fibroscan could be the way to go. So if you now have cardiology commenting and the American Association of Diabetes adding in NAFLD assessment for standards of care for type 2 diabetes, you now have a van, Webby. Is there a comorbidity option to be able to see these patients and work out that comorbidity management? Do you think that would be something that would be a, a, certainly a strength of Heart of Australia from what you were describing? I think the answer to that question is yes, in that I would say that I've had conversations with cardiologists initiated by cardiologists who had been to a meeting maybe five or six years ago where they approached me and said, well, look, we've heard that you can do the single fibre scan and we've heard that we should be looking at the liver. So this isn't something that's just suddenly happened. Obviously, with all of these recommendations, often the initial studies go back a few years. And actually, you know, I remember going to an ARSL meeting probably 15 years ago where the Kaiser group presented all their data. And at that time, there was no link between fatty liver disease and cardiovascular outcomes. And that was hundreds of thousands of patients. So it's only really been in the last five years where that link may have become a bit clearer because up to that point, it was a little bit grey. It never made any sense. Of course, if you've got fatty liver disease, you're likely to have some cardiovascular, poor cardiovascular outcome, but it's never really been demonstrated in a convincing way. So I think now cardiologists are more aware of that. And I think the Australian environment is very conducive to this because many of the doctors, even you know all the senior doctors and certainly cardiologists in particular, are very protocol-led. And so if you have a, an American Heart Association guideline saying that you have to do this, this is something they will do. It, they just need to have an avenue to allow that to happen. Now, the issue in Australia is that obviously you don't have a Medicare billing code for a fibre scan. So that limits the availability a little bit and many private practitioners, because you know, obviously in terms of the Australian healthcare system, within Queensland for definite, I'm not sure about Western Australia, about 60% of most of healthcare happens in the private sector and about 40% in the public sector. So most of the public hospitals now in, no, when I say most, the public teaching hospitals in Queensland have a fibre scan, but the other hospitals uh, don't. And so access for the public patients is limited to teaching hospitals only. And then if you look at the private practitioners, say for example in Brisbane, you know, there are only maybe two or three private facilities that have a fibre scan and the others don't. Because again, the billing is an issue and patients occasionally don't really want to have the test done if it's not going to be billable. So I think access is one thing. And this really goes back to the cardiologists. You know, Once that guideline is taken on board and they want to try and access this, then they then have to have a facility and for it to be made easy for that to happen. So I'm still working on that in terms of thinking about it. At Prince Charles, you know, we're a big cardiac hospital. It's a, it's a heart lung transplant hospital. So, and they've got, you know, I think, 150 cardiologists there. We don't actually get many referrals from the cardiologists at the moment. All our referrals come from primary care. You might have to look at all of their fit fours. <laughs> Just as a background piece of, um, let's do a retrospective review of the cardiology of Fib Fours. And now, back to Roger. We hope you enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingnesh.com. We'll be back next week with a discussion of the recently pressed AASLD guidelines and how they relate to the important need to bring frontline providers who treat the patients with diabetes and obesity into this discussion. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.